Hi, this is Greg McInerney here for NUTV News. I'm delighted to say we're joined today by President Ayun, of course, our president here at Northeastern University. President Ayun, thank you very much. For Hello, Greg, today. and it's good to be with you and NUTV. Thank you, sir. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, can I just start off uh, maybe with a bit of background about yourself that the students may not have heard before? I believe you're originally from Beirut, yes. Lebanon. If you could just maybe talk me through how you managed to go from Beirut to Boston, if you will. Okay, I uh, studied and lived in three continents. I, you know, I lived in uh, Beirut, Lebanon. I studied there up till my master's. Then I went to France. I, I had an advanced degree in France, in Paris. And then I came to the United States, actually to uh, Cambridge. I went to MIT to study uh, and have a PhD there. After MIT, <coughs> I went to Los Angeles, stayed there around uh, for 24 years, and uh, then came to uh, Northeastern to be the president of Northeastern five and a half years ago. So you know everything about me now. Yeah. Do you think that um, certainly it's quite an international education? Do you think that that's influenced the way you see things here at Northeastern University? You know, a comparative approach, Greg, is always good because it tells you, it, it leads you to understand and what is happening in the world, what we do here, what is different from uh, what is being done elsewhere. So it gives you a great comparative vantage point to be able to roam the world. And all, throughout my career, I have traveled in over uh, in 95 countries. And I know the education system uh, in various countries, so that allows me to s appreciate what we do here that is, and that is different from anywhere else in the world. By here, I mean not only the United States, but here at Northeastern. I think it's fair to say that since your uh, tenure here began, you've gained quite a bit of notoriety within both the education, educational system here in America and even, even in the political spectrum. At times, in fact, um, I think you were recently appointed as the chair of the American Council of Education. Yes, that's correct. You could tell me a bit about maybe what your role is. is uh, the, the, to be. the American Council on Education is uh, the largest association of colleges and universities in the nation, and uh, the the purpose of uh, the American Council on Education and people refer to uh, the American Council on Education as ACE is really to promote higher education, to support higher education, to uh, explain higher education, and also to groom the next leadership in higher education. And uh, I am the chair of uh, the board uh, of uh, this uh, organization, which uh, allows us to really promote the importance of higher education in the nation and to uh, is ask for support uh, at the federal level and at the local level too. Mm -hmm. And I think something that might appear maybe perhaps stranger to, to certainly certainly me as someone who's not from the United States is your appointment to the Department of, of Homeland Security Academy, Academic Advisory Yes. Board. What's, what is the purpose of... As you know, uh, security research in, at Northeastern is extremely strong. Mm -hmm. We are a leader in this field. We have a Homeland Security Center for Explosive Detection. We have uh, an NSA Cyber Security Center for re Research and Teaching. And importantly, we also have the Costas Institute in Burlington that allows us to, uh, to do research focusing exclusively on security. So if you look at now what is happening in the world and what's happening in the nation, in the United States, research on security is needed. For instance, we have an enormous shortage of uh, people working on cybersecurity. And cybersecurity is a must. That's a domain that is needed. So what we do here at Northeastern is, in this domain is really to focus on research in cybersecurity and also training in cybersecurity. Similarly for explosive detection, similarly for uh, sensing and imaging, similarly for the notion of resilience. Resilience, namely after an attack, for instance, you want the city to recover. How can you, cre you know, a, have an infrastructure that could compensate for that what was hit? So we are 
uh, from this perspective, since this is a national priority, we have been asked, I have been asked to serve on the Homeland Security uh, uh, Council in, uh, with the Department of Homeland Security. And also I have been asked to chair the research uh, uh, domain or the research section of uh, this endeavor. And this is due to the fact that we have leadership in security research. Mm -hmm. I believe um, your, what triggered your involvement in, in that area was was I think it was uh, was it? Am I correct in saying that you ha were in opposition to cuts that the Obama administration was proposing on uh, domestic? Uh, no, we, we, we in, then my involvement with the Department of Homeland Security was not triggered by the possibilities of uh, cuts and uh, otherwise. It was uh, really uh, I have been asked to serve, and this is something that uh, we feel is part of our obligation and especially that uh, uh, part of our leadership. Now, w when we looked at possible cuts in the past, poss the possible cuts in the past with respect to Homeland Security were triggered by discussions about the budget, per se. And so we, you know, and uh, we, are, we didn't, we're not involved in pushing there for, uh, uh, you know, uh, to increase in the budget or not, we're putting a strategy for the nation in terms of homeland security. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the administration, whatever the administration is, has to look at, you know, the, what, how much it will cost and what to invest in it. Mm -hmm. So we, will ask, we are asked now to look at devising a strategy for security research and security training in the nation. There seems to be quite a a clamoring, particularly in this election year, for for a reduction in 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 defense spending from from the U.S. government. <clears throat> Do you think that, in some way, um, advisors like yourself who hope to keep um, at least the, the the normal funding or current level of funding as it is. You think that's somewhat against with public opinion? You know, Greg, uh, let me tell you, we are not, once again, we, you know, the Department of Homeland Security doesn't report to uh, the Department of Defense. Those are two separate entities. Mm -hmm. But once again, our work on the committee, on the council, is really to devise a strategy for security research and security education in the nation. Our job is not to push for more in, uh, funding or less funding. Mm -hmm. If the government uh, agrees that this uh, strategy is sound and strong, then it becomes the responsibility of uh, the government and the elected officials to see how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So we're not there as a lobbying group. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it fair to say, though, that Northeastern has quite a vested interest in the subject, considering, as you pointed out, the large amount of research grants we receive from... Absolutely. Absolutely. We have a vested interest in, you know, research in the United States, as you know, Greg, is supported by the Department of uh, Energy, the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Health, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense. Every cut that you see in uh, the, uh, the will impact uh, the uh, uh, research not only at Northeastern but in research universities in general. And ha it has uh, implications for the nation because we're competing uh, on a global level. So when you see, when you visit, for instance, uh, the Chinese universities, the Chinese universities are receiving massive investments in uh, research from their government. and. You know, and there is a real competition there at all levels, whether it's you know it's health, sustainability, energy, etc. And you know, we the this is why I think it is imperative to have a national strategy for research. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the interest. There's also private interest there. There's, there's considerable funding from from not just the defense department, but also from private companies. Absolutely. Private, like, for Absolutely. Example, weapons manufacturers. And stuff well, like it depends because you have in cybersecurity, for instance, you have uh, places like EMC that was one of the, the largest data storage company in the world that was started actually by two of our alumni, 
Ambassador Egan and Roger Marino, and you know, you see their buildings on campus. For instance, they have an enormous need for cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a domain that is needed in the civilian uh, and non-defense related industries, mm -hmm. as well as the defense related industries. But there are also other companies that are specific, they're not just, we don't just cater to cybersecurity, we also cater to- Absolutely. To hard hardcore. Uh, uh, manufacturing of more, for want of a better phrase, aggressive. You know, for instance, we don't ha here for the, the, our the Homeland Security Center for Explosive Detection mm -hmm. is we, we're, we're not working on developing weapons or anything like that. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. What we do is quite the opposite: trying to detect. Uh, somebody, for instance, wearing explosives in uh, walking in a city. So it's all detection and prevention. We're not in uh, the weapons business. Okay. Uh, President Ayun, in an ideal society, what is the role of the university? The, the university has two roles. One, the first mission is education, to educate individuals for a lifetime of fulfillment and accomplishment. And that's what we have in our mission statement. The second role is really to promote growth by and serve society by, and by doing research that meets societal needs. And once again, this is what we have in our uh, mission statement. Those are the two pillars of university, of universities in general, and that's what we capture in our mission. Mm -hmm. um, coming from uh, a European uh, collegiate system where probably for the most part it's it's heavily state subsidized if not free um, do you think university education is is a right or a privilege it is a right and a privilege both what do I mean by that every person should have the opportunity to have an education but also it's a privilege in the sense that if we're giving this if we are given this opportunity, it's up to us to make the most out of it. Um, do you, does the I mean, tuition in, in America has, has never been higher. I mean, to go to Northeastern for a year probably it costs cl close to fifty thousand um, dollars. Does this worry you at all? Let me tell you what we have done at Northeastern uh, here we have what we call the annual promise. Namely, every student who comes to Northeastern will, you know, will have a package of financial aid based on his needs or her needs that will go for four years. In addition, with this year, we are adding another dimension to the annual promise, saying if we change tuition, if tuition increases, and your uh, situation changes, your financial needs change, uh, uh, we, are re we are automatically going to adjust it, to adjust the financial aid upward. 80% of the students at Northeastern receive financial aid. So you have to keep in mind that 80% that of the students are on financial aid. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have done. And in addition, we overall, $188 million every year are given to financial aid. That, that, those are not loans. Those are grants, mm -hmm. scholarships. Uh, from a more macro perspective, why do you think the, the fees have, have grown so astronomically? You know, the, what you are seeing is that in the public uh, universities in the United States, since you asked me at a back macro level what's happening. Public universities are state subsidized. You know, the individual states subsidize the public universities. Th throughout this recession, pub uh, the states have divested from uh, public universities. So what public universities have done is to increase their tuition and increase their fees dramatically to compensate for that. That's what's happening. So if you look at it there, uh, uh, the public system is under stress. You know, public higher education is under stress. 
and you are seeing cuts, you are seeing places that are closing programs, closing departments, refusing to admit students. That's the main situation that's happening now in public universities in the United States. Mm -hmm. And what about the increase in, in levels of the, in the private, private sector? The, if you look at, for instance, what happened at Northeastern, let me speak about Northeastern yeah. because each place is different from this perspective and I'll be happy to, mm -hmm. to talk about uh, the macro issue too about private universities. It, but at Northeastern, over the last five years, the percentage of financial aid or financial aid has increased at twice the rate of uh, the tuition increase. Why? Because we, what we are saying is that the need for, uh, in this time of recession, for the students is greater. And that's why financial aid has increased at twice the rate of uh, tuition increase. Mm -hmm. So you have to put that in this perspective. There is an argument, though, that the reason the United States system is, is considered the best in the world is because there simply is more money involved. And that money not for the for the entirety, but a lot of it is borne on the shoulders of students who attend the universities. I mean, university debt has reached a trillion dollars. It's great. It exceeds the amount of credit card debt in this country. Is that not a hugely worrying trend? You said two things. So let me <clears throat> take each one separately. First, you said the university system in the United States is the best in the world because, in fact, uh, the students pay for that. In fact, when you look at the spectrum of higher education in the United States, when you bring into account the publics, the privates, etc., you see that there, there are in, very important subsidies given by uh, the state, the individual states, the government, also individuals with philanthropy. Don't forget, philanthropy is you, almost unique in the world in, uh, here. It is very well developed. So when you walk on campus and you see uh, various buildings with names, those are people who have invested in uh, and helped the university. Many students have scholarships, as you know, named scholarships. Donors have done that. So if you want, the, yes, there is tuition. Yes, there is state support for um, the publics, there is governmental support at the federal level for research, for financial aid, and there is philanthropy. You cannot reduce it to one uh, dimension only. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that when you say, with this picture, uh, what is happening with the cost of higher education? Once again, if you look at what's happening in, uh, at Northeastern, we are reducing uh, de facto the, fi the, to, uh, the cost of attending school because we have increased the financial aid. Now let me be honest too. On an, if you are an international student. As an international student, you don't have access to this financial aid system. It, it bec why? Because uh, those are restricted to the students who have uh, in American citizens, uh, citizenship. So from this perspective, you know, for you, the cost of higher education when you're here for a year on a visiting program is, uh, is higher than the one for domestic students. At the same time, you're getting uh, an, an advantage because you have now an, also an American education. Now, if you look at the trend worldwide, including the trend, for instance, in the UK, including the, what's happening now with uh, uh, many private universities being launched all over the world. That's what they are trying to emulate, the fact that there, are, there is private, uh, a private system of education, public system of uh, higher education with different price points. Mm -hmm. It's a trend in the UK, though, particularly that's been widely protested by <coughs> particularly the students. Absolutely, population. absolutely, because the UK has not done fully that, nearly in the sense that the government said, okay, we're going to allow universities to ha decide what tuition they want to charge up to a certain point. And clearly, you know, at the same time, you know, they didn't liberalize the system fully yet. So 
they are putting more, more constraints at the same time the, this is, those constraints are driving universities to go for the higher tuition. Absolutely right. That's what's happening there. You see, that gives you another sense. Students here have choice. They can go to a pl private place, public place. They can look for which place is giving them the financial aid, the largest financial aid. That's the beauty of this diversity. It's not one system fits all. But I think that operates under an assumption that the quality of education you receive from a public university is the same as a private university, which is certainly I don't not not the case. I don't think you have. Let me tell you, you have quality public universities, and you have quality private universities. What is different is that sometimes, like for instance here at Northeastern, our approach to the education is very different because it is based on co-op and experiential learning. And, and we are the leaders in this domain. You don't find that in a public system in this way. We, we, and so when people are looking at universities, quality is everywhere. It's not in, everywhere in the same way. But the choice is not between private universities having quality and public universities not having quality. The choice is what is the philosophy of education that is going to be the most relevant for you that will allow you to discover uh, what you're good at, have a job, and have a fulfilled life. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm telling you, you know, in the United States, students have choices. Mm -hmm. it's because it's not one system fits all. The, the, the level of choice, though, it, if you are laden with debt when you leave university, is somewhat constrained. You mentioned that Northeastern, and you're quite right, offers the students the ability to follow their passions. Um, but when you are faced with a, such a level of debt burden leaving university, it's very difficult maybe to follow your passions if they're not as commercially viable. You see, the, the beauty of what is being done here is that, as I told you, within nine months, 90% of the students have a job or go to graduate school. Mm -hmm. It puts us in the nation as the university that has the best record in placing students in what they want to do. So from this perspective, our students are well prepared for life. Well, they immediately do need a job, though, because But precisely, the beauty of... Yeah, but you see, Greg, listen uh, to uh, this, this statement again. We ha are the university over the last five years that had the best career placement mm -hmm. in the nation. Why? Because we have this co-op system that allows you to do it. And in fact, as you know, the students, most of the, the majority of the students get their job uh, offers from their co-op employers. So the, the fact that Northeastern has the largest number of applications of any private university in the nation. That's what happened last year. We had the largest number of applications. Students want to come here because the education they receive is allowing them to be fulfilled and at the same time to find jobs. Mm -hmm.